But this my pantry, 4,000. So we do, I do everything I can to help these people feed their children. Uh, we have, um, um, an amazing number of individuals who are willing to help us do this. But I can I, some days our, our storeroom is empty. And uh, I've noticed that the food drives, especially the one that we had just a couple of days ago, we only got 250 pounds of food times 11 pantries. And that was an all-day drive that many of us worked. So uh, I know that what I do is being done 11 times over and uh, giving people food just so that they can survive and get out and do their jobs is, is uh, uh, one of the most important things that I think that I can do. Um, I'm Mary Oldham with Mountain Harvest Farm, so I guess I'm on kind of a different notch on the food chain. Um, we're growing food, so um, my husband and I run about a four-acre <coughs> operation outside of Morgantown. We grow exclusively vegetables, um, and we sell at the Morgantown Farmer's Market downtown, um, and also run a CSA program, which is like a subscription program where people pick up a box of vegetables every week. Um, so we're providing, I guess how we're addressing food insecurities, we're providing food, um, but often that is limited the pe to the people that can afford it, right? So um, one really cool opportunity we've been able to be a part of this past year, um, actually two years now, was um, the Starting Points Farm to Pantry CSA program, um, which Jenna Loans helped uh, set up out at the Shack neighborhood house and basically it's a program that um, purchases CSA shares from us and distributes them to to uh, 10, I think there are 10 families involved in it this year at the Shack neighborhood house. So it, it it's a way that we can, they do all the work basically, it facilitates us to be able to provide food to a, a different income bracket of people which we probably couldn't reach easily otherwise, so we're really grateful for their coordination to help make that happen, um, and that really feels good to us. So that's one way we're working on that. Um, then as farmers were at the Morgantown Farmers Market, um, uh, Morgantown Farmers Market Growers Association operates the downtown Morgantown Farmers Market and also over in Westover, and sort of like Suzanne was saying, you know, there's a lot of need in this community that you wouldn't think there is. And even over in Westover, you know, there's no grocery store and there's a lot of folks in that area, um, a lot of senior citizens that kind of rely on that farmer's market now to get their fresh produce. So one thing we did this past year was, um, through the farmer's market group, was um, get a SNAP grant from the USDA. So we're going to be doing a lot more outreach to get more folks with SNAP benefits to come to the farmer's market. and. Um, and our farmer's market is actually pretty good about that. We accept WIC and SNAP and senior coupons. And that represents a fair amount of income for our farmers. And it also is a way for those folks to get fresh produce. So, um, And we also operate a gleaning program where Christian Help, uh, which is a, um, I guess they operate a food pantry as well, downtown Morgantown. They do a lot of different things. But they have a gleaning program where they come to our farmer's market and pick up stuff from our farmers and distribute it. So, again, that uh, makes it pretty easy for us. So, um, I'm Joey Alloy. I'm from Kizra, and Kizra is a nonprofit that does a lot of things. And one of those things is operate the uh, greenhouses and that we call Paradise Farms. And I'm in charge of marketing the produce from that, and also. Um, hopefully increasing people to use our facilities as an aggregator for um, regional uh, food hub work. Um, I guess specifically um, Kisner's Growing Jobs Program is not specifically focused on increasing access, it's more in focused on improving um,
con local control and ownership of food production, right? That's the idea is that you help people learn how to make a living growing food. Um, or maybe not make a living, but at least per have some supplemental income and supplemental um, nutrition from doing so. Uh, now that said, KISR, like I said, is a big organization, so we do a lot of other things focused on ac uh, access, right? So our farm is located at the western edge of Dunbar, um, towards Institute. The community of Institute does not have a grocery store. Um, the western part of Dunbar does not either, and we sell produce um, and accept SNAP benefits out of our greenhouse. Uh, not a lot of folks come in there, but um, uh, definitely for the few folks that live in that neighborhood, um, we are a uh, we increase access uh, to food. We also have a daycare center, Kizer does, um, right across the street from our farm at our main uh, building where the offices are. And um, we feed the kids there, of course, right? Daycare and after school programs. Um, we uh, have uh, donated food to Manameal in Charleston and to uh, Huntington's um, Facing Hunger Food Bank. And one of the things uh, that they do in Huntington, uh, pretty neat, they do a, a similar program to what Mary was talking about uh, with a CSA, you know, veggie box sent out to folks um, who pay for it um, at a reduced price with uh, SNAP benefits. And um, that is somehow coordinated through a cooperation between the wild, Huntington's Wild Ramp um, Market and uh, Facing Hunger, Hunger Food Bank, and uh, it's a great program. Um, and then uh, we have a project going on on the west side, and I have no idea when it's going to take off. But um, <laughs> the neighborhood where it's where it's located is uh, also a food desert, and we are um, probably going to be doing just sort of the same thing that we're doing at our Dunbar location, selling produce out of the farm, um, but we are on the fence about operating a retail location there. Um, one of the things, so uh, we, we do, um, you know, I mean the whole point of uh, teaching people how to grow, we're, we're helping folks um, re-enter society with the criminal record um, and in boosting entrepreneurship and uh, uh, wealth building in the communities. Um, and. Uh, we would need to train folks in lots of different types of jobs to be able to run a retail location. Um, so it's sort of daunting, but it's a project that we want to take on. Um, we just don't know how long, how long away that's going to look. Uh, my name is Ken Peralta, and uh, my organization is called Grow Ohio Valley, and we're based in Wheeling. And um, well, we. We're kind of organized around the idea that um, by stimulating local food industry in our region that we can really transform it uh, socially and economically. And we really believe that. We drank our Kool-Aid. And, um, and so we have a myriad of programs. Uh, our focus right now is really uh, growing capacity uh, for local food production and for local food sales and uh, two other areas, uh, education programs, uh, and that's in-school gardens. We, uh, we hosted a garden in every school contest uh, in uh, Ohio and Marshall counties, uh, mostly so the schools who wanted gardens would put up their hands. And we had nine schools that uh, responded. Uh, the winner was Central Elementary down in uh, Moundsville, and we're helping them to build an outdoor learning center uh, a garden-based learning center, and uh, we're also working with a handful of other schools. And uh, another program that we is actually going on as we speak, it started on Sunday, is a food justice immersion program where we have uh, our inaugural uh, group of students uh, is 18 students from Notre Dame University, and they've been really exploring food justice from all different sides of the equation. So. I think it was their first full day. They were each given a dollar thirty-two, which is their uh, daily food stamp allotment, and they were let loose to go see what they could rustle up for lunch. And uh, they were smart. They combined their resources, so they were able to actually buy some beans and rice and like that. And uh, and they've been hearing from uh, doctors and single mothers that are on food stamps and single mothers that make too much so they can't get food stamps anymore. 
and uh, hard working on the farm and uh, just really getting uh, fully embraced in that. And I think that has a lot to do with uh, uh, solving issues in food, food security is getting people steeped in the reality of what it actually means. Um, we also uh, operate a mobile market. We trialed the concept last year with a grant from the uh, West Virginia Food and Farm Coalition and also the Community Foundation in Ohio County. And uh, we are an upstart organization. This is our second official year. And there's, there's about a year or a year and a half of backstory uh, to that also. So it's really like three years, even though we only count two years. And uh, Last year we said, well, we want to do this mobile market, but we also need a work truck. We need a flatbed. So we kind of bought a flatbed and uh, uh, configured it with some fold-down shelves and trialed the mobile market concept. And after doing that, we realized, well, hey, we can go to these high-rise uh, uh, buildings with elderly inhabitants and show up and sell a farmer's market fare for an hour and make 80 to 120 dollars or something like that and that seemed like something we could make a business out of because though we're a nonprofit, part of our story is that we're going to be surviving on our own cash flows in in seven years and that's that's the reality for the most part for nonprofits is it it's got to be run like a business and uh, based on that, we, uh, we went out and got a snap-on tool truck out of, off a farm in Ohio, and we towed it back to Wheeling, and we built a mobile market that uh, this year ran uh, guess 20 stops a week, six days a week at the peak. And uh, that was a combination of food deserts where there are you know, just no grocery stores or uh, low-income housing authority homes. <coughs> Uh, you know, apartment buildings or, again, elderly inhabited uh, high-rise buildings to basically bring for, uh, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables and other food items uh, to the doorsteps. <coughs> One thing I just learned last week that West Virginia is the third oldest state. It has more people over 65 years uh, than 46 other states or 47 other states. Ohio County is one of the oldest three counties. So we really do have this kind of, that combined with um, uh, grocery stores closing, the flight of grocery stores, and then having really kind of crappy public transportation makes for a perfect storm for food deserts. And um, so that's kind of what we're up against. And uh, we got gathered a lot of data. Hopefully we can get that back to some of you folks here at WVU, and we can just figure out how does how does a mobile market really need to operate? What does it need to do? Um, and I'll be happy to talk more about that. The final thing I'll say is just uh, uh, growing food, getting people to grow food, if, whether it's in schools or it, really any way we can, it seems to be the most fundamental way to address problems with food security. Howdy folks, my name is Adam Taylor. I work for the West Virginia Farmers Market Association as a project coordinator. It pretty much means I uh, develop, organize, and execute all the projects that we do for the organization. Uh, we work on a, a large scale, I guess, as far as farmers markets go. Uh, we work as, with individual vendors, and we work with the farmers market as a whole, and we work in different programs that they want to set up. Uh, so working with them as a whole, uh, we have a farmers market training network uh, where we help uh, farmers markets get off the ground if a community is interested in, in organizing a farmers market then we have the tools and the expertise and we go through it and try to help them organize that and then once we get that established we try to work with our vendors to let them have as easy access to vending as they can and understanding all the things that go with it. Um, we work all across the state and so I mean it's a diversity of markets whenever you travel around the state you might have a really nice farmers market like we have here in Morgantown doing amazing things has a lot of you know, customers and a lot of vendors, and then a farmer's market, say, in McDowell County, West Virginia, is going to be different. That farmer's market was there to increase access to healthy food, fruits, and vegetables. So it's just uh, finding all the farmer's markets around the state. We do a census of them all, and we try to track them and keep up with what they're selling and what they're doing, and we collect all that data, but it's supporting them on the level that they need support and catering it to each region as we go.
Hi, my name is Rick Wilson. <clears throat> I got involved with this project when Bradley and Josh actually found their way to my farm. And our great Pyrenees did not eat them, you know, which <laughs> generally has pretty good taste. So uh, <clears throat> I work for the American Friends Service Committee, a group started by the Quakers. And I don't know whether this is cool or sad, but the group first came to West Virginia in 1922 to work on child nutrition. And we're still working on child nutrition. I can't decide whether that's cool or terrible. <clears throat> The good thing now is that actually West Virginia, at least as far as school nutrition, is one of the leaders in the nation. And I want to talk about some success things, some fun things you can do. Basically, I believe life is a game, and anytime you improve conditions for kids, working class or poor people, you win. You know, and so there's a project I want to tell you about that you might actually get involved in in Mon County right now. <clears throat> so this grows out of uh, there was a Feed to Achieve Act passed in West Virginia a couple years ago. And before that, you may have heard of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, which was a federal thing in Congress. The goal of the Feed to Achieve is to eventually make sure that every kid who goes to school eats without having to apply, without eats breakfast and lunch for free, and we, they eat nutritious food, and it just becomes part of the culture. I mean, think about it. We don't make kids pay for classroom instruction. There's not a coin slot on the desk, right? Uh, they don't have to pay for textbooks. Why should do they have to pay? Or nutrition when you know kids can't learn if they're not well really well fed and also if you're going to make someone come to your house for eight hours wouldn't you probably give them something to eat that would just be rude right so one of the things that we've been doing lately is look at there's a program that's called community eligibility provision and what it does it allows school boards this goes down to the counties to provide free breakfast and lunch for all kids in schools where at least 40 percent of the kids are certified as being in poverty you know, if you live in an area where there's high poverty, looking for someone who can actually pay for lunch is like looking for a needle in a haystack. So what this does, it takes away the stigma. Everybody gets to eat, and there's no more applying for free and reduced lunch. Seth, I talked to Seth from Mango. Mango is one of the leaders in this program. They provide free food countywide. It, uh, it gives a break to working people. It also lets the schools concentrate on feeding kids instead of collecting bills and doing stupid paperwork and things like that. It's a winner all the way around. West Virginia first became eligible in 2012. 35 counties did it. The next year we kind of fought and nudged some counties. 39 counties did it. Last year 40. This year 46 counties do it. That leaves nine that don't. And it's really fun just to fight and nudge and work with local people to get them to bug the school board until they do the right thing. And then you can actually count it. It's like, holy crap, that is like X number of schools with so many kids. We recently finally got Wood County. Anyone here from Wood County? <clears throat> it's a, for some reason, the school board there took pride in not doing this and made, you know, it was really weird. They were proud of not feeding kids, and finally this year they caved, they did it. And so every kid, 13,000 kids are going to get free breakfast, about 5,000 are going to get free lunch, boom, across the board. And Montagalia County is one of the counties eligible for it that does not do it yet. And there might only be one or two schools in the county. I'll leave that to they're very good hands to figure it out. But I hope you guys get involved with it. It's really fun just to find a place where you can make a difference, a legitimate target, and hit it and see. It's like kicking a pop machine and having money roll out. So. <laughs> Um, I'm Liz Spellman, and I'm the director of the West Virginia Food and Farm Coalition. You probably noticed coming down the line, um, it's a little bit more policy-based and less grassroots, uh, fortunately or unfortunately. So the Food and Farm Coalition is a statewide network and of food producers, consumers. We're trying to be um, as direct training focused and policy changing as we can to everyone along what we call the local food value chain. So that would be restaurateurs, institutions, anyone who's eating, buying food, and involved in building up local food systems. The context here, I mean, the organization started as a way to transition, um, economic transition tactic, um, and you know, building up a local food economy where there aren't other jobs. So what we're finding, of course, is that it's um, tricky for farmers to make a living wholly in West Virginia, and there are many ways that we can try to change that and improve that um, and one of the big ways that we're working on right now is state food policy changing um, but um, supplementing your income and other opportunities in the state are are pretty pretty valuable when you know the statistics I think on farmers markets are average farmers market vendor makes hundred fifty dollars 
at a market on a weekend, but when you think about what that can do to supplement your income or help pay, you know, if you're a retiree, um, that, that actually can go a long way. So um, we've been focused for the past five years, we're a pretty young organization, um, on on growing local food businesses and supporting the business side of things, thinking that if farmers can be more successful, then perhaps that will affect food access because if there is no local food production, then there's just less food to go around. Um, what our latest conundrum is, is how are we connecting this alternative food movement, which is what we're calling the local food value chain, to emergency food and all that's going on, all the infrastructure, all the work, and um, all the folks who are served um, by, that, by that system as well. So what tangibly what we've done is we've helped jumpstart some mobile farmers markets in West Virginia in several counties um, so we can pilot projects, so we can get big pots of funding and then split it up in different counties to work on projects, track data, figure out if things are working and if they're not, just keep trying new things. Um, and we work, we work with various groups on putting together trainings, so we work very closely with the Farmers Market Association, for example. And um, we have had a lot of success with state food policy change, um, because legislators really like talking to farmers and thinking about agriculture. It's kind of a very neutral, neutral grounds unless you're asking people to give a tax incentive for local food donations, which is our current issue, that we're, for the first time, running into some, some roadblocks. But um, this year, we're working on laws to support local food procurement. So if you are a farmer and want to sell food through an institution like a hospital, there are tons of roadblocks to who is allowed to sell wholesale. And while we may not have a lot of farmers that are at that scale yet, cooperatively there are farmers who are. It's a really feel-good um, venue and we're really not going to affect food access on a large scale in West Virginia unless we can start hitting some of those markets. Um, we're going for a tax deduction for local food donations. So right now, if you're a supermarket, and I know Dr. Wilson and Josh know a lot about this, so pipe in. But if you're a supermarket and you donate food to a um, food bank or food pantry, you can get a tax uh, deduction, a pretty significant tax incentive based on how many, it's done by weight. So if you're donating Skittles, maybe some of you already know this, um, uh, you would get the same benefit as you would if you're donating bananas or something healthier. Um, but farmers who are donating aren't necessarily getting the same benefits because they're not incorporated in the same way that a larger uh, corporation is. So anyway, those are some of the examples of what we're working on. Thanks, everyone. Um, so Liz pointed out that they, there is kind of some order to this, and it actually could just keep going. It could, so state scale, national scale, global scale, because a lot of our foods are traded, a lot of the stuff we eat is traded in Chicago on the Mercantile Exchange, right? And how do we, how do we go and intervene there? Well, maybe we feel powerless to intervene with traders in Chicago, but at least we can start here, right? For me, this is really hard. It's like a huge barrier in the food justice movement, these processes and you know, time-space compression, making everything smaller and cheaper and more competitive. Um, and a barrier that the next three years I'll be thinking through. But I want to ask our panelists next, I'm going to combine the next two questions. From your vantage point, what's the most difficult barrier you face on a day-to-day -day basis? And in light of that, why are you still involved in food justice? And what's especially exciting to you and keeps you going despite these barriers you face. All right. Um, I think what's difficult is what I alluded to with that alternative food system and what's already existing, uh, not only conventionally, the conventional food system like supermarkets and um, big ag kind of industrial production, but then also the emergency food system and how that all fits together. I think what keeps me going is that West Virginia hasn't made some of some of the mistakes that states that are have more advanced local food systems have made. So we have a really great potential to build a food system collectively that serves all people, as opposed to we're just 
creating this system that will serve really niche markets or tourism or something like that. Um, but yeah, there there is a big challenge I think in in thinking through these things if farmers themselves are often food insecure, couldn't even afford their own food. So. Thanks. Well, I think uh, when Bradley was talking, one of the biggest barriers to food security or anything that's growing inequality in this country, it's happening globally, it's happening in West Virginia and in the U.S. Again, the wealthiest 1% in terms of income and wealth is incredible. The power of corporations, the corrosive power of money in politics, <clears throat> and the political climate in the country and in West Virginia makes it really difficult to fight for working class and poor people. The school food thing is just one of the issues that we work on. So how do you keep going? One way that I keep going is like, this is like from an ancient Roman philosopher, Epictetus. You know, some things are within our control and some are not. Does that make sense? There's some things you really might not have an effect on right now, but if you continually pay attention to figure out where are the areas where you can hit it and get some things done, that's the way you do it and that's the way you keep saying. So one way I've stayed saying this summer is like, I think West Virginia is going to hell in a handbasket, but damn it, there are six new counties that are feeding kids. They're like, that's like millions of meals. And so like, you know, you figure out what thing you can actually do to move it along and then try to wait and build for the next opportunity so you can do more of that. Well, I'm not going to be as deep as they were, but uh, I'm just, uh, I don't know, just a different perspective is like if you're wanting to work in this, in this field, the kind of wheels that are in place to do so are not efficient to achieving your, your, your goals. I mean, we're all guided by funders who want to put everything into a box that we can't fit, and a lot of time it's a lot of guesswork just to report to them while our time is not spent doing what's most important. You know, it's easy to lose track of the goal of what we're doing when you have so many people that you're trying to please and have consensus with all the time. Like, uh, we all work for board of directors or, or, you know, have so many partners, and you're not going to do anything when your board's disconnected from the work you're doing every day. So the challenge is a lot of the times is just getting consensus on the people you're working with just to get to that goal of increasing food access. So maybe something a lot of people wouldn't say, but it's a reality that happens. Um, I think that, you know, humans are highly programmable units, um, and it's really true, you know, if, if you, like, if three of you got together and just kind of flashed images in my view space without me knowing, uh, you know, like when I got on the bus and got in my car, and then at the end of the day you came up to me and said, close your eyes and tell me what image you see. What I'm going to see is most likely the image that you've been flashing at me all day. That's and you know that all these mentalist programs on TV now are always doing little tricks like that. And uh, one thing that really struck me this uh, statistic, and it, it, uh, when Bradley put up the a number of stores, it showed that 47% of the grocery stores are convenience marts. And uh, uh, there's a, a econometrician out of Chicago, and I, I don't, I never remember her name, um, but it'll be easy to find it. She did a lot of work in food deserts, anyone who's interested in finding out. And she, uh, through analyzing data, proved that, um, and the, the metric she used was years of death added. So more years of death is more unhealthy. Uh, and she proved that uh, in food deserts that had a convenience mart, there were twice as many years of death added than food deserts without convenient marts in them. And uh, that's obvious, the reason why, because it's uh, Skittles and Ho-Hos and, and Twinkies and all of that kind of stuff that's available on SNAP benefits. So that really skews things a lot. Uh, so, you know, what do you do when you show up with your mobile market filled with, you know, cashews and uh, Swiss chard, which, you know, we've taken to calling West Virginia spinach, and uh, uh, kale and these kinds of things, because, you know, people don't know how to use them, and also we're like a convenience-obsessed society where you need convenience. And we're all under a lot of pressure and time to get somewhere and do the next thing. And uh, so I, I kind of see that as the biggest barrier is how do we, how do you change behavior? It, it's hard changing behavior, you know. Uh, anyone started going to the gym lately, <laughs> you know. It's hard to change our own behavior, much less to kind of collectively get at a society and change behavior. And, 
And so, uh, you know, we're still grappling with ways to do that. We, one program that I'm really excited about next year is we got a, a pretty sizable grant, $10,000, uh, to uh, address um, uh, low-income shoppers, SNAP and WIC shoppers. So maybe that's a CSA uh, program like Mary's doing, or maybe it's a double value coupon program, or whatever it is, we don't exactly know yet. But the funder asked a great question. He said, well, what, how is this a sustainable program so that next year you're not back again asking for uh, more money to throw over the fence so that poor people